you want to ask me about uh, what, my biography and my politics in general, yeah, etc. Talk about your history. Sorry? Talk about your history. Well, I was born in Berlin in 1931. Uh, my parents, my father was, uh, came from Russia and my mum was uh, German. He, um, he, my father was born 1903 and as a kid of 14, he, he sympathized with the Bolsheviks like every intelligent person in Russia at the time did. And he told me he saw, he heard Lenin speak and he heard uh, Trotsky speak in St. Petersburg, etc. I joined the Communist Party in Israel, I'll tell you in a minute what, why, uh, many years later. And my dad used to say to me, who the hell is this Stalin? I never heard his name. In 1917, nobody heard Stalin's name. Everybody knew who Lenin was, everybody knew who Trotsky was, but nobody ever heard about Stalin. And uh, around when he, he was born in 1903, he went to Germany in 1923. Through Germany, he wanted to get to Paris to study economics. Some uncle sent him some US dollars, and, uh, and he took the money and went to uh, Paris to study economics. And while he passed through Berlin, he decided to take a day off and spend a day in Berlin. And this was during the big inflation. And what he discovered was that for one US dollar, he could live a month. A month! So he stayed in Berlin, and there he, uh, he met my mom, and they got married, but he couldn't get a job. So they, he went to Buenos Aires, got a job, and then they came back to Germany in 1931. Her father died. And uh, they, they, she was pregnant, my mom was pregnant, and I was born in Berlin in 1931 on my mom's birthday. We both have the same birthday on the same day. And uh, not look at Ronnie. It's, it's off to him. Okay. Just keep looking directly. At you? Yeah, yeah I look at you. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, th and the Nazis came to power. They had to settle the inheritance, my mum's inheritance. So, so when he went to Berlin first, this was when there was a wheelbarrows full of money to buy bread, yeah? Sorry? Wheelbarrows full of money to buy bread. In Berlin. Not only this, if you went into a restaurant, they charged, you paid the bill at the end of the meal, because be between the beginning of the meal and the end of the meal, the value of the money changed. So they did the, the calculation at the end of the meal, <laughs> because if, you, if they agreed on the price at the beginning of the meal, it would have been, they would have lost money. So you always had the, uh, the bill, you got the bill and everything was made out at the end of the meal. Anyway. So uh, then uh, uh, the Nazis came to power, 33, January 33. I was two years old. They were still in Berlin. And, and then my mom told me I was lying in a cot and she was looking in the radio for some music. The radios just became very popular. Uh, people bought radios, etc. And she was looking for some music and suddenly she hears somebody, she hit a station and somebody was screaming, we'll drag the Jews out of their beds in the middle of the night into the street and we'll chop off their noses. And she said, she was sure, it's a play somewhere. And, um, and then the announcer said, you've just listened to the speech of Hermann Göring, the deputy uh, the prime minister and the party and the Nazi party Congress in Nuremberg or whatever. She said, my God, this is how number two is speaking. I don't want to stay here. I want to go. And my dad comes home from work. And she tells him what she heard. She said, and my dad understood politics because he was uh, the end of the Russian Revolution, etc. So uh, she tells him, he said, nah, but you know, politicians, they talk, they talk, and it nev never comes to anything. And, uh, and she had a guts response. Okay, then there was another time, a few months later, in the summer, she was walking in a park in Berlin, and suddenly an SS officer comes in towards her and is doing the Heil Hitler salute. And she turns around in the street to look who the hell was he saluting? Because she had both her hands on, on the pram, pushing me in the pram. And, the, and she, the street is empty. And he returned the salute to someone. You don't salute just out of, out of the blue. And then she looked and she saw me in the pram. I was two years old. I was doing this. And he returned me a salute. You see? So she came home and she says to my father, the child is imitating the Nazis. We'll grow up a little Nazi here. I don't want to stay here. I want to leave. And my dad says, OK, OK, I'll start looking for something. And they had an affidavit for the States. 
And then final, the final blow came. The Nazis put down laws. Jews are not allowed to teach in any uh, educational institution in Germany. Thousands of academics lost their job overnight. And Jewish children in school have to sit on a separate bench by law. My mom said, my, my son is not going to sit on any separate bench in the school. And my dad said, OK. And they went to Palestine to see what it's like. And they didn't know anything about Palestine. And they were not Zionists. They were not nationalists. They were liberals, assimilationists. You know, they were middle class uh, um, European uh, modern people, like everybody else. What year was this? Did Sorry? What year? Um, we're talking about 1933, 34. And then they decided to emigrate, and they went to Palestine in 1934. Um, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Sounds good. It's good. It goes up. Can you check the levels? Can you check the levels? <coughs> when, we're, when we're rolling, can you check them? Okay. Sure. Why do you mention that nobody knew about Stalin? Sorry. Why did you mention that nobody knew about Stalin? Ah, because I, when I was in the Communist Party, Stalin was, uh, you know, the father of the nations. It was, it was at the height of the, um, of the uh, personality cult. And my dad, I joined, the, my politics were, while I was a kid in Palestine, so basically I grew up in Palestine. Although I was born in Germany in 31, uh, the first three years of my life in Berlin, I remember nothing. And from 34 onwards, I grew up in Palestine. I went to kindergarten there, I went to junior school there, I went to high school there, I was in the underground uh, there, everything. All the kids, the generation, we were about half a million people in Palestine, half a million Jews, and a million Palestinians. And the Jews had their own little society, institutions, everything. And I grew up like an ordinary uh, Jewish kid in Palestine. Of course, most of the time at the seaside. The big entertainment, we were always at the seaside. My mom said to me, we arrived in Jaffa, a port of Jaffa. I went down, I went, saw the beach in Tel Aviv. The snow, which was white, the sand, which was white like snow, and the crystal clear blue sea, and I said, "This is where I'm staying," and uh, because it it was like an eternal holiday, you know, the weather is always good, etc. So they all stayed there, and the funny thing is, they didn't at first. The first three years, they didn't suffer from the heat, because they had a feeling that they are on an ongoing holiday. They're all the time holiday, and only when it hit them that they are stuck there for good did they start sweating in the summer. I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 physical conditions are not everything. It's what psychologically how you how you digest them, and uh, and the first three years they were on an eternal holiday, blue skies, uh, blue sea, uh, with snow white sand, etc. And then after three years they started sweating and the, <laughs> and complaining about the heat, etc. So I grew what up you, there. What do you mean the underground? Sorry. What do you mean you were in the underground? I'll tell you, uh, uh, look, when you join, the British were, were the rulers of Palestine. The police was the British police, you saw there was the army everywhere, etc. And of course the Jewish community in Palestine clamored for independence. At first they clamored for more, allowing more Jewish immigrants into the country, but the British had to take into account the Palestinian Arab demands, and the Palestinian Arabs rightly refused to allow more Jews into the country because it would uh, upset the uh, demographic balance. So the, the Jews used to demonstrate all the time against the British uh, to allow more immigrants, etc. And after World War II, uh, then the, 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 the Jews and Palestine started to demand independence. And they had underground organization, what now will be called terrorist organizations. And uh, <laughs> so if we are into terror, I can tell you a few stories. But in the, there were... There were three underground organizations in Israel at the time. The biggest one was the Haganah defense, which later became the Israeli army. And this was under the domination of the Labor Party. The community of Jews in Palestine, let's say, was roughly half a million. One in ten was in this organization. 50,000 people were in that organization. This was led by Begin. No, 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 no. This was led by Ben Gurion. And then, and their policy was never to, to hit any British soldier, nothing. Only to prove to the British by hitting installations or something like that, that it is worth their while, the British while, to support the Jewish uh, community and the Haganah because they can pull off a lot of feats. For example, one night, the Haganah in 1946 blew up uh, 20 bridges all over the country simultaneously in one night. Not one British soldier was hit. 
But to show the British, we can pull off such uh, operations. And their aim was basically to show the British it's worthwhile to rely on the Israelis, on the Jews in Palestine, to allow that community to grow. And when they grow, eventually to achieve independence. They did not want independence while Jews were in a minority because they did not want to have a South African-like situation. They didn't want to have a situation where a minority of Jews will rule a majority of Palestinians. And while the Jewish community was only half a million and the Palestinians were a million, they didn't want independence, the Labour Party. Then there was a split and a, a small section be, became more right-wing, nationalistic, that was Begin's lot. And they said, countries are conquered, history teaches us that countries are conquered by blood. And forget the whole thing about uh, becoming a majority and making the land bloom. We got to get rifles and we got to fight the British and then the Arabs and then we'll rule the country. So they, they, their anthem was, in blood and fire Judea fell, in blood and fire Judea will rise. And they wanted in fact to create a state which will include Palestine tra and Transjordan, both of them, and, and to run this state like a resurrect. King David's kingdom. And the emblem was a combined map of Palestine and Transjordan together. And on top of this, a hand, an arm holding a rifle, and underneath the motto was only thus. And this was run by Begin. But they were ten times were smaller. They, were they inspired by the, the promises made in the Balfour Declaration? Yes, but, but, they, wanted in, but they wanted independence right away. If need be, by force of guns. What's the, what's the history behind that? Why were they... Why were they Look, during the Second... During, during the First World War... The why during, they promise the nation? Sorry? Why were they promised a nation? They were not promised a nation. They, were, they felt a nation already. They were promised a country. They were promised a country. The motto was... The Zionist motto was... A country without a people to a people without a country. And the country without a people was supposedly Palestine. And there was, they presented it as if it, it's, it's empty. And the people without a country was the Jewish people all over the world. So they want that country, which has nobody living in it, for that people which is dispersed all over the world and has no country where it is a majority. That was uh, the general idea. But uh, the difference between... How, how many Palestinians were actually moved out? According to the British census, the first reliable census, after the end of World War I, in 1922, I think it was the 12th of October, 1922, there were in Palestine 600,000 Palestinian Arabs and 60,000 Jews, out of which the majority were religious Jews who were non-Zionist. So in 1922, the Arabs outnumbered the Jews by 10 to 1. And in 1948, they outnumbered the Jews by two to one. And yet the United Nations in 1947 carved the country up into two equal halves and gave the Jews half and the Palestinians half and proposed the creation of two states. This is the famous partition plan. But anyway, to go back, the Begin's people were uh, ten times smaller than Haganah. They had about 5,000. And they were the ones who wanted to conquer the country by, by guns. The Haganah said, no, we've got to populate it. We've got to have farms, farmers. And once we have a social, economic uh, infrastructure spanning the whole country, then, and we become a majority, then we shall demand independence. The Begin people said, forget all this uh, crap about uh, growing tomatoes in order to win the, over the country. We've got to, to use guns and win over the country. But they were a minority among the Israeli Jews. The Jews in Israel, the, the vast majority supported the Begin's people, uh, supported Ben Gurion, and only a minority supported Begin. Now, the Begin lot had a further, a further split when World War II began, because the question was, now that Britain is fighting against uh, Nazi Germany, what should they do? Should they continue to fight against the British, or should they stop? And they had a debate, and as a result of the debate, they split. Most of them said, now that the British are fighting against the Nazis, we stop all the hostilities against uh, the British, and we join them in the battle against the Nazis. A minority, however, headed by a gentleman called Abraham Stern, said, no, we continue to fight the British. And if they want our cooperation, 
then let them give us Palestine, and then we shall, uh, we shall uh, uh, support them. And these people... These people who blew up the, the, the hotel, yeah? Uh, no, the, the hotel is later, 1946. Later, later. That, that's later. But this lot, the, the, Stern, the gang. Stern gang, yes, they numbered sometimes 500. So get the idea there numerically. The Jewish community numbers about half a million, 500,000. Out of this, in the underground Haganah, 50,000. In the Begin's organization, the nationalistic right wing, 5,000. And in the Stern Gang, 500. So you get a proportion. Now, the how Stern many, Gang... How many of the whole population would regard themselves as socialists? How many of the whole... How many of these people would regard themselves as socialists? At that time, back in, 19, uh, in the 30s, I would say between half and one third of the population. And they had communal farms and... Uh, the lay, basically, what set up, the, what built, constructed the, the Jewish uh, institutions in Palestine, the society, is the Zionist labor movement. Everything was, came from the labor movement. They had uh, the, a health insurance scheme and social security scheme, and they built the hospitals, everything. And they built up the agriculture and so on. But what I wanted to tell you one more... The kibbutz is actually started... That's all the labor party. But it started in the 30s, didn't it? They started in the 20s. In the 20s. In the 20s. Yeah. And that, did that have a sort of socialist... Of course, they were communal farms. Nobody owned any private property. Everything was shared by everyone. Could you, start, could you say the kibbutzes start like that? Yes. Say. What? The kibbutzim? Start, include the question in the answer. Describe the kibbutzes. Ah, this, uh, let me just finish one thing I want to tell you about the, the, the split between the Stern Gang and the Irgun, that means the tiny, smallest uh, terrorist organization, if you wish, yeah. and uh, the Begin's lot, the, the little one, the ones who said, we will support the British only if they give us Palestine. And if they go, don't give us Palestine, we'll continue to fight them during World War II. They went to negotiate with the Nazis. And Israel's Prime Minister Shamir, who was a few years ago as Prime Minister, he was one of the leaders of that Stern Gang organization. And he went to Italy to negotiate to the fascist. I mean, if people think that Jews can't be fascist, they don't know what they're talking about. There was an organization willing to cooperate with the Nazis against the British during World War II. And it wasn't unique, you know, like you go in, in, in India, the uh, Gandhi's party split, and there was a, a section willing to negotiate with the Japanese to fight the British. This was all based on the, the, the politics of my enemies. Enemies are my allies. Same within Irish nationalism, eh, James? Yeah. Same within yeah, Irish nationalism. Yeah. Was, within Irish nationalism, there were people who were prepared. They were setting bombs off in London during the war, weren't they? Some people. So, uh, so if people say, and of course people talk now about terrorism, I remember the, the photos of Begin and Shamir stuck on a wall saying, wanted dead or alive, 1,000 pounds sterling reward for these people. I mean, Shamir, if you come to Israel today and you go to Jaffa, which was the largest Palestinian town, about 250,000 people, and you go to the central square in Jaffa, where the clock tower is, and on one side was the police station, and on the other side was the court. The big uh, hall of the court is, to this day, still uh, a, a shambles. Half of it was blown away. How was it blown away? Mr. Shamir placed the lorry full of uh, the, uh, the explosives uh, there and blew the whole uh, thing up. And now he talks about terrorism, and the guy himself was an arch-terrorist. You know, it's ridiculous. So what were relations between the Palestinians and the, the new settlers, as it were? When? Uh, back in the back 30s? Then. Back in the then. 30s? The Palestinians realized that the Zionists, if, they were not an anti-Jews. The Jews in the Arab world were never persecuted as they were in Europe, because there's no quarrel between Islam and Judaism. There is a quarrel between Christianity and Judaism because uh, the Judaism claims that Christian, Christianity, Jesus, was a false messiah, a false uh, savior, and the Christians claim that the Jews don't recognize the real savior. So there was a, a quarrel, and Jews generally in Europe were persecuted. They dressed differently, they ate different food, they spoke different languages, and they were persecuted. And the Arab world, no. They spoke Arabic. They dressed like the Arabs. They ate the same food. They were much more integrated into the Arab society than ever in Europe. And therefore, there was, there was almost no case of, of uh, 
uh, pogrom in the, in the entire Arab world, one or two isolated cases. Whereas in Europe, it was almost a common uh, phenomenon that uh, if anything goes wrong, blame the Jews and uh, like any minority, might as well blame the gypsies. Okay, so um, uh, in the Arab world, they were very integrated, they spoke Arabic, and the same thing applied in Palestine. It wasn't very different from what it was in Morocco or in Algeria. They lived together. These went to the mosque on Friday, and the others, the Muslims and the Jews, went to the synagogue on a Saturday. But they both spoke Arabic, they ate the same food, they dressed alike. If you were to go to a, a city like Morocco or Casablanca or Algiers in the 1910s, and it was very difficult to recognize who is a Jew and who is an, who is an Arab, because they dressed alike and looked alike. So the, the, the Palestinian Arabs didn't look with hostility on individual Jews. But they felt that the Jews who come from Europe, the Zionists, are a threat. Because these people weren't just immigrants. They came with the idea of turning the whole country into a Jewish state. Now the Palestinian Arabs said, what do you mean? We, we are the majority here and we've been living here for generations, at least since uh, the, uh, the 7th century. And you want to come and take over this place and make it this country for you? And what about us? So they didn't take to this uh, very sympathetically. And, uh, but remember that the Jews didn't run the country. They didn't dominate it. It was the British. So the, the, the Arabs had a problem with the British authorities. And the basic demand was to stop the Jewish immigration to Palestine. And the Jews were to demonstrate just, against. Just the discrimination uh, against Jews in Germany. I mean, the, the, the fascists accused the Jews of being, on the one hand, sort of capitalists or finances, or, and also on, on, on the other hand, of being communists as well. Just Everything. Complex whatever. Argument. Yeah. A, being communist, B, being uh, uh, f uh, manipulators of finance who were uh, sucking the blood of the German uh, community, society, that's it. But you know, y there is a point here which people are not aware of. Fascism is not necessarily always anti-Jewish. Look, Franco. Franco was a fascist, and yet uh, he, he, never he never let uh, Hitler exterminate the Spanish Jews. And even Mussolini was uh, very different from Hitler. I mean, he handed over Jews who came to, to Italy as refugees, but he wasn't that happy to hand over the Italian Jews, although they were persecuted, but not the same way as Germany. Germany, uh, Hitler had a particular uh, twist in his, his brain vis-a-vis uh, -vis Jews, and, um, but they weren't quite apparently, clear. Apparently, when he got turned down for art school, the, the majority of the people on the panel were Jewish. I don't know. Maybe. Difficult to tell. But you know, even the Nazis, it, it wasn't always clear from right away from the beginning that it will end up in Auschwitz, in mass uh, extermination on an industrial basis. No. At first they wanted just to get them out of Germany. There was a plan to evacuate them to Madagascar or things like that. And only as late as 1942 did they decide on what they called the final solution, that uh, they cannot get rid of them by sending them elsewhere. And therefore, they, uh, they will uh, exterminate them in an industrial manner, on a massive scale. And uh, that's it. Yes. That, that's happened then. So let's say my parents didn't leave Germany as refugees. They left out of their own free will. They went to Palestine. And, uh, and you know, for me, the, it's, it's odd, because my father, who understood politics, if it were up to him and to rational considerations, he would have never left. And yet my mom, who didn't understand anything about politics, and all she had was a guts response, she was the one who said, we are leaving. And it was, it was the guts response which turned out to be right, and the rational consideration which turned out to be wrong. Because nobody, it never happened before on such a massive scale. Nobody could imagine such a thing. It wasn't quite clear. It was clear that the Nazis will persecute the Jews, but not that there will be a mass extermination. I had a friend, a very a, a, a Viennese a Jew, who came to Britain, a, the poet Erich Fried. Uh, he was a member of the Nazi, of the Nazi, of the uh, uh, Austrian Communist Party, and and he told me that in his school in Vienna, he went to, he was born 1922 or 21, and he left Vienna in 1938 and came to this country, and he said to me, Aki. 
don't demonize the Nazis. They were people like you and me. In my class, which was a class at a, a, a public school, uh, no, not public school, a high school in Vienna, the children who joined the Nazi party were just like the children who joined the Communist Party and the children who joined the Zionist organization. Namely, they were children who were sensitive to what happens in society around them, and they, were, they cared about society around them, and they cared about all the unemployment and the misery which existed, and they wanted to do something. And this lot, the Nazis turned to... Nazi, after all, stands for National Socialism. And they became National Socialists, others became Communists, and some became Zionist, various... So uh, th they weren't necessarily motivated by hatred. They, they chose a certain way to solve the problem of their society. The fact that it eventually ended up in extermination uh, chambers, th that was not something they, they knew or expected or even wanted. But by the time they woke up to the implications of the particular political uh, direction they chose, it was already too late. They couldn't do anything about it. But if the, in the early days, Hitler rose to prominence as a sort of organizer of hit squads and fruit trees to attack progressive organizations and the trade unions and the left, anybody that looked at them could yeah. see what they were. Yeah, of course. You could, know, you could know what will happen in a second. And a lot knew the moment you looked at the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish Civil War was a rehearsal and everybody could see what's about to happen. And although a lot of Britain, people, Britons were very complacent, everybody on the left knew this, means, this regime in Germany means war and it will be something we've never seen before. And the left will be... You know, inside the Trotsky movement there was a big debate. There was a big debate whether the, the Trotskyites should advocate uh, the support of the, of, uh, of the f powers like Britain and France. And Trotsky was of the opinion that it's similar to the First World War and that uh, it's not the, the, the business of the workers whether to support uh, one side of capitalism against the other side. But I knew a guy in Palestine who wrote a letter to Trotsky it was published in Trotsky's uh, magazine, a Bulletin of the Opposition, and where he said, no, this is a different story altogether, because it will make a hell of a difference to the left whether Nazi Germany wins or Britain and France win. Although both of them are capitalist, etc., but they are not the same thing. It's not a repetition of World War I. It's not another war for redividing the world. On one side, we have a kind of political system which has never before been seen in history, and it will mean disaster. It will mean extermination to millions of people, not just to Jews. And uh, so it wasn't quite clear what Nazi Germany is going to be to some people. But, um, but those so the, 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 the social democratic governments in those countries you talked about also strangled the Spanish Republic. Yes, of course. Cold I mean, they were, look, they were all afraid that if, if the Spanish Republic asserts itself, it could provide an example that will be very attractive to a lot of left-wing forces, and, uh, and therefore they didn't want uh, the whole thing to, uh, to succeed. They tried to keep a neutrality, whereas, Bri whereas Germany and Italy supported Franco wholeheartedly. They sent troops, they sent aeroplanes, they sent weapons, etc. So uh, it was uh, eventually this support... Uh, helped Franco win the war. Yeah. You just hold one second. Well, how much you got left on this tape? Yeah, 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 I'm okay. Now... Could you, could you talk about the role of Zionism uh, in relation to the Jews in, in World War II? Uh, yeah. Well, the Zionist movement... You have to remember the Zionist movement until, let's say, the 19... Uh, early 1940s was a minority movement amongst Jews. I mean, consider the, 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 the emigration of Jews from Tsarist Russia. Between roughly 1870, when the pogroms started in Russia, to the First World War, 40 years, a span of 40 years, 5 million Jews ex uh, emigrated from Russia to the United States. 5 million. And they formed uh, the bulk of the Jewish uh, uh, community in the United States. Only 5,000 emigrated to Palestine. Now, that means that one 
and a thousand out of Jewish immigrants leaving Russia, one and a thousand went to Palestine, whereas the other 999, 999 went to the United States. And this gives you an idea about the weight of the, 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 uh, of the Zionist movement in the Jewish community. First of all, the religious Jews, who were about 20% of world Jewry, were opposed to Zionism. Because according to them, only God will resurrect Jewish independence, and as long as Jews are non-believers, most Jews are non-believers, there's no point in resurrecting Jewish independence, because it, it'll produce a state of blasphemers anyway. Now, and the remaining 80%, the majority was assimilationist. Most Jews, the, the Jewish civilization is in a process of disintegration ever since the French Revolution. People leave the religion, and the moment you leave the religion, your sense of Jewishness becomes diffused. Because Jewishness is an identity, a cultural identity, which depends in, on a religious uh, uh, culture. And if the religion loses its meaning, because people stop believing in God, then the whole thing gets diffused. And, and, and there's a constant, people are, are um, troubled by an identity complex. I'm Jewish, but yes, I feel Jewish. But what does it mean to be Jewish? Now, a religious Jew never has this problem. And uh, so... The 80%, most of them wanted to assimilate. Herzl himself, the founder of the Jewish, uh, of the Zionist movement, was an assimilationist. And he wanted to, uh, to assimilate and become like all the others. And then he encountered discrimination, social discrimination, not legal, social. And uh, he said, okay, if you cannot assimilate as individuals amongst other nations, we shall assimilate as a group amongst other nations. That means he shifted the idea of assimilation from the personal, individual level to the national collective uh, level. And that's Zionism. Zionism, we want to be a nation like all other nations. Instead of being we want to be an individual like all other individuals, it moved to we want to be a nation like all other nations. And that, uh, that in other words, Zionism is basically nationalistic. It's Jewish secular nationalism. And most of the Jews uh, didn't take to this. Einstein, for example, was opposed to this all his life. He said, we go back to all these things of uh, nationalism when we managed to liberate ourselves from this, uh, from this uh, ideology. He was opposed to this most of his life. And uh, only after World War II, when the details about the Holocaust became clear, did many Jews uh, change their minds and begin to support uh, Zionism. Until World War II, the Zionists were a minority movement amongst the Jews. And after World War II, as a result of the Holocaust, they became a larger section, probably a majority. And the many Jews, out, once the State of Israel was established, also mainly because of the Holocaust, because the United Nations voted for this only because of the Holocaust, people felt very guilty. And so they voted for a, carving up Palestine into two, and the Jews having a state in their, in their half, and the Palestinian having another state. And then uh, many Jews all over the world began to support that state. And uh, it, it, for many of the Jews who had a, a diffuse sense of cultural identity, of ethnic identity, relating to that state in the Middle East, in Palestine, the, the Israel, helped to show up the diffused sense of cultural identity. The, these people, like say Jewish people in America, after the creation of Israel, find themselves in a situation similar to American Italians. They know they are Americans, but they also have a sense that they are somehow related, their culture relates to Italy. And the American Jews, when Israel came into existence, they are in a similar situation. They can say, of course I am an American, but my culture is focused on Israel. What they don't know, that in Israel itself, the question of who is a Jew and what is cult Jewish cultural identity is extremely problematic, more problematic than elsewhere. It's, it's a big so problem these, there. So these are the people who subsidize the state of Israel? To the Sorry? Tune. These are the people who subsidize the state of Israel to the tune of what, five billion a year from America, yeah? Yes, yes. They, they so will they donate a lot of money. The majority wouldn't go there. They wouldn't want to oh. go on a, on a hillside surrounded by Arab villages with a gun, but they give money, yeah? Yes, they give money, and they are more extreme than the Israeli Jews. Most of the Israeli Jews uh, respect the Palestinians. In the, in the, during the British mandate, 
my generation, people who grew up in the 30s and the 40s, we knew the, Palestine, the country was populated by Palestinians. We respected these people. We didn't want to uproot them. No, we wanted to live side by side together with them. And, and, and these people like me are much more uh, uh, moderate and willing to come to compromise with the Palestinians than many of the American Jews. You see, they sit over there, they don't know anything about uh, uh, Palestine, and what they know is that the Jews are being persecuted just for their identity. But we know it's different. I